it's so good to be with you. I've had some people comment on my red boots. I would say that I have preached in five-inch heels. Now, you, this won't mean anything to you guys, but I have preached in five-inch heels and three-inch heels, but these are the best there is, okay? <laughs> and what you can't tell, the creme de la creme, is I have candy cane striped socks on, too, which <laughs> makes it doubly cute, and I would have been cuter, but... My outfit I was going to wear today is in the dryer, and to my shock and surprise, when I got up this morning, it was not in my suitcase. Well, so I just have to do my very best anyway. Amen. Well, why don't we clap our hands and just say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And I love you guys. You know, one thing... And uh, we have one of our prophets from the ACPE, I don't know if she's in the room, but Mary Glazier, I, I don't know if you're here, Mary, but she, uh, she is, they call her Thunder Woman, she's from Alaska, and she's an incredible woman. But one thing is we met this year, and, and I want to say we're not exclusive, there are many groups of prophets, and we need many of them. The Lord told us that he is transitioning us from the company of prophets to the family of prophets that it's about relationships. And so the th when you run with somebody a long time, there is a seasoning. I mean, I was talking to Bobby this morning, you know, in the green room, we were just talking a minute. And there's something that happens when you have relational equity. And we first met at the Apostolic Council of Prophetic Elders. We, were, we didn't know we'd be called that then. Peter Wagner came up with that title, so don't fault me for it, even though I'm now, like, I can't say the head because we kind of all function together. But um, God did give me a word in 1999, and this was before the year 2000. Does anybody, I know we got some old folk in here. Does anybody remember Y2K? Okay, we were all going to die, right? Sheer death. We were going to starve to death. I personally was in, thanks, Robin, I was in round tables, and we were discussing should people store food or not store food. I know people born in that year are totally shocked. But, you know, we had to decide, and so... Uh, we decided, uh, well, actually, I decided initially <laughs> that we needed to gather the prophets. And at that time, many of the U.S. prophets did not know each other. And also, this may be a shock to you, but in the year 2000, you understand that was 24 years ago. I'm trying not to fall over my boots. Anyway, that was 24 years ago. There weren't that many prophets. I mean, seriously. Most of them were in the caves, you know, and, but we didn't know each other. And so I remember I called Peter Wagner, and I said, Peter, because um, I was, how old was I? You know, not, I was young. Anyway, and I thought nobody would pay any attention to me, but they would to Peter Wagner. So I said, Peter, let's gather the prophets together. And I, can I put your name on the letter because they'll come because of you and not because of me? And it just worked. Listen, you have to get a strategy, all right? Where there's a will, there's a way. And so we came, and we had about 20 of us, and we met in Colorado Springs. And um, it was very interesting at the time, and, and Rick Joyner was one of those that came. Uh, and many of us didn't know each other. I, 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 I didn't really know James Gall yet or, you know, many, many others. We had Dutch Sheets and Chuck Pierce and just a group of us there. And as we met together, when you meet together, a strategy forms. Now, and, and you know, Bob Weiner, you were one of the pioneers in the prophetic also. But what happens is God doesn't tell everything to one person or one prophet. That is incredibly frustrating to me. People come to me and they say, well, who's going to be president? Or who's going to be this or that? You know, and sometimes God doesn't want to tell me that stuff. You know, and I just have to you know, humble myself and say, I don't have a word about that. You don't have to have a word about everything. 
Okay, this is just a little mama talk, okay? You don't have to have a word about everything. But it's good when you come together, that new wine is found in the cluster. I was talking about relationship, Isaiah 65, 8. And so when you come together, you get the mind of the Lord. And this is why God has created us. And there's a lot of different kinds of prophets. I mean, you know, in our group now that we come together, you know, we have a, uh, we first had our council of prophets that we've met 20, uh, uh, 24 years. And we have like 50 on that. And, but we can't dialogue with 50 people that well. So now we, we, I got a word from James Gall in 2017. I don't know whether to thank him or kick him. But, you know, we were meeting and he prophesied that we should find prophets from the whole world, the todo mundo, okay? I'm like, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm going to confess my carnality to you at this moment, okay? He is saying that I was called of God to find prophets from the whole world. And my brain is thinking, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> that is going to cost me a lot of money to find those prophets. And I'm going to need a scholarship, a lot of them. And I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm, because I'm, my brain is putting all the administrative details into this. And we've done a lot of gatherings and, you know, Tom Hardiman and different, you do these things and you know there's a lot of work behind it. So anyway, and so how do you gather prophets from the whole world, right? You, you, you know, you think it's hard to have a community dinner or something and, <laughs> and the word of the Lord and that we were doing it at our church in, in Texas, Cedar Hill. Oh, by the way, before I forget, we are issuing the word of the Lord from Acts 13. The Acts 13 model says that the Holy Spirit spoke to the prophets, not to an individual. So we do not sign our names to this, but we put a document together, and actually from both groups that meet together, the ACPE and the Global Prophetic Consultation, where we have, this year I think we had like 32 nations. We were down a little bit after the pandemic. But anyway, and so if you want to go to generals.org, it's going to come out in the, in the next week. So what we do is we put all this word together. Everybody sends in a word, and then I spend days collating it. You know, thank you, James Gall, who gave me this word. Have you ever wanted to kick a prophet? Come on, just be true. Just be true. Be honest. You know, they give you this big word, and then you've got to do the word. You know, and the thing is, as a prophet, not only do you give words, but then you give words, and then you have to do something with it. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Okay. So there are things we have to do. And so, uh, and, but what, what I understand now that I didn't, and I've been doing this like 45 years. I know you're just saying, you can't have been that old. Anyway, but, and, and so what, what I have learned is, is that, we have to learn as prophets to be skillful in our gift. And we have to learn to be adept. You know, the Bible says, and Chris just gave us his excellent message, that God has set, set and given this gift to prophets to equip. The word equipping there in Ephesians 4 is the same word to set a bone in place. Caratismos. It literally means there will be a divine adjustment given to the body when all of these gifts are together. Well, the prophet has a particular role. And so what we're seeing is that we can mature in our gift. Amen? And so, but what is wonderful, and I'm going to ask this for you up there in the nosebleed section, um, that that God give you relationships. Amen. Because when you're a prophet, people think you're weird. Even I think I'm weird. I mean, I, we're strange. We're, we're strange people. 
I mean, I wake my husband up in the middle of the night, and I say, Mike, there's going to be a terrorist attack. And, you know, he's just trying to sleep, you know. And so 3 a.m., you know, and he's a deep sleeper, you know. So I wake him up, Mike, Mike, there's going to be a terrorist attack, and there's somebody getting on a plane out of, out of I, uh, I think it was, I don't know, it was London, Paris, because I've done this more than once. And, and, and. And they're going to blow up the airplane. You know, and he's kind of (laughs) like toothpicks on his eyes. And so, you know, he just knows what to do. He just throws his hand out there to agree with me, you know. And I'm like praying and I'm warring, you know. Father God, we just bind that spirit of terrorism and we forbid it from taking place, you know. And he's just like, (laughs) he's a good guy. But, you know, you remember that um, underwear bomber? Okay, well, he didn't blow up his underwear because somebody prayed. (laughs) And I'm sure not just me, but others prayed as well. And I want to say to you that the rule of the prophet, as long as we've been working at this, It's not understood to the degree it can be. And every year, and this wasn't in any of my notes, but this is just for free, uh, and I have a very short time. But every year, I strive to to obtain a sharper gift. I strive to do better at the gift. And I actually critique myself, and I ask the Holy Spirit to help me. Okay, I just ministered. What did I do? Holy Spirit, were you able to do everything you wanted to do? You know, it's said that many times in a service, if we just let the Holy Ghost do it the way he wants, he'd get everything in there, even the announcements. But in the charismatic Pentecostal bubble, we can get kind of routinized, which means routine. We sing two fast songs, three slow songs, and then we have announcements, and then we do the offering, and then we do the preaching. Well, what if the Lord wanted to mix it up? Oh, now I'm getting in trouble. Oh. And what about The Bible says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Maybe he wants to do some praying in that service. Just thinking out loud. And so I am always working at myself. A few years ago, I, it occurred to me, that I'm, I know I'm called to be a prophet to nations. I mean, I live, eat, and breathe nations. People say, what's your favorite nation? I say, the one I'm in at the moment. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I've been just driving people crazy practically. So I'm going to Morocco. I'm so excited. And I'm, I'm going to, to places where... The gospel has to be preached, and the church is underground in some of these places. And I'm going to some others I'm not going to name. And I'm just so excited about it. And, and what I am doing in my role and my gifting is I am stretching myself to go into places where they need the word of the Lord. Okay? So... I'm never going to stop pioneering, and you should not either. We are not called to be settlers. We're called to be pioneers. So whether you're in the marketplace, whatever you are in, are you pressing towards the mark for the high calling of Christ Jesus? Are you just being boring? (laughs) Teaching the same things, doing the same things. Boring, boring, boring. But I have come to challenge you to greatness. 
That was thematic last night. And the, and the prophetic, uh, we met with the prophets over and over. They got up and said, come up higher, come up higher, come up higher. So God is calling us, us, you and me, as a family. God is calling us to function better and function together. You know, even you can tell when people prophesy what version of the Bible they read. I used to be King James. And this young upstart came up to me one day and just knocked me off my King James pedestal and said, what version of the Bible do you read? I think I went, I was maybe a new King James then. I thought I was so modern, you know. And, and so, so uh, they said, I can tell because that's the word how you prophesy. And I realized I was not contextualizing. Now, let me explain that. Putting in the context. I wasn't using the word of God. I wasn't the instrument God gave me to prophesy. I was not prophesying in a way that people could understand. You know, prophets talk in code. Don't you mix linen and wool or whatever. I mean, don't mix this. And I'm sitting there thinking, what in the Sam Hill does that mean? <laughs> and I'm, I meet with these young prophets. Uh, we, were, we do round tables around the world of prophets. Now we have round tables for Australia, New Zealand. There's one for all of Europe. A phenomenal European prophetic round tables. And they're just doing great, great work. So we've grown up a lot. And uh, here you have 400 and something being trained. You're doing an amazing work. Bethel's doing a great work up there with our buddies, you know. But what, what I realize is that we have got to come to maturity. And so I was at this round table in Cartagena, Colombia, and this prophet, I won't say what name in Latin America of the country, said, I see my country as a purple flower. And I'm looking at it. And this smells sweet. But what can anybody do with that? Who cares if it's a purple flower? I want to know if they're going to have a revolution, okay? I want to know what God is saying. We use so much typology that you have to get a commentary to understand what are we talking about. I believe God talks to people in a way they can understand. Don't shout me down. I'm really preaching good up here. You forgot. Amen. Amen. You forgot. And one day you forgot the preaching rules already. Okay. So I realized as a prophet, that I needed to mature. So what, one thing in pressing towards the mark, and, and my notes are just going up in flames over there, but one thing about pressing towards the mark is that am I using my gift to the full measure and scope I could use it? Am I, and because what happens? When you give a word and it's rightly placed in that influence of society, whatever spear, whatever mountain God is calling you to, what is going to happen is they're going to know that God is real. They're going to know that he really speaks today. So, you know, if you read the gospel, you see that Jesus, you think he just tripped around it. Oh, here I found a tax collector. Oh, there's a tax collector. Be good on my team. No, I knew he knew the influencer. You understand this? What, you know, what, what about, um, you know, the fishermen? They, they had a fishing industry. They had people that worked for them. Don't you think he knew exactly, I'm going to touch this industry. I'm going to do this. When he went in to see Zacchaeus, don't you think they knew that Jesus knew he was a strong man over that area? And if the strong man of that area, and he called his name and said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house. That that was was the deepest need Zacchaeus had. 
dad who was a pariah in that society, and Jesus didn't rebuke him. He called his name and said, I'm going to go. I don't care if they think I'm unclean. I'm going to your house. I want to stay with you, Zacchaeus. And all of a sudden, what happened? That deep soul felt need in Zacchaeus was so touched by the prophet saying his name and loving him that he had, that Zacchaeus essentially eradicated the poverty of a city. He said, if I have been corrupt, if I have taken from anybody, I'm going to restore it full, full, fold. I'm going to get half of everything I own to the poor. Now that's using your gift effectually. Can I get an amen? Amen. I have a dream for the prophetic movement that we will come up higher. I have a dream for the prophetic movement that we will believe God will rightly place us, that every day as we go, we are little soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ sent on a mission. Then when we get up in the morning, we're going to have a lot of Holy Ghost spirit, spiritual adventures in that day. Because we are commissioned to follow Jesus. Amen. 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 So as I as I realized I needed to come up higher, I thought, okay, I'm going to Korea. South Korea, of course. And but well, anyway, I won't go into that. Anyway, um, and, and so I thought, I need to see the highest government official I can see, and I need to ask to see them. You see the difference? I used to just let things kind of happen, but I wasn't using my gift skillfully. I didn't know how to leverage the gift in a godly way. And so it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I mean, remember when when the prophet, you know, when Naaman the Syrian came and he had leprosy, do you think that that the prophet just Elisha just said, Well, if I'm supposed to meet Naaman the Syrian, there'll be a dove that comes and sits on his shoulder, and then somebody will go give him a word, and then they're going to bring him to me. No, what did the prophet say? Bring him to me that they may know there's a prophet in Israel. Why is it the world goes to psychics and mediums, and we have the word of life? Because we don't know how to use our gift. And we don't know how to function as we can function. And we're not intentional enough to take the grace and the gifts of the Lord Jesus Christ and use them to disciple a nation. So I said to my friend, get me in to see, you know, the president. And the president was out of the country. I said, well, you know, what about the mayor? The mayor was in town. So... She said, this lady, I don't know the mayor. And I said, well, make a cold call and call the office and tell them this. A prophet from America wants to give you a word. (laughs) Go for broke. Come on. Let's just, you know. If we're going to be a prophet, be a prophet, you know. Put up or shut up. And... (laughs) I don't know if y'all are ready for this this morning or not, okay? (laughs) It's only 11-something in the morning, but I'm going for it because I got my boots on. So anyway, so the mayor gave us an appointment, and my friend Cheon was there too, so Che came, and, and Mike and I. So the thing is, you do these audacious things, and then you got to do something, okay? <laughs> you really got to get the word. No pressure. And, you know, I know you think that we never suffer, but I suffer for the word, okay? There's times I'm suffering for the message. I'm not sure if I'm giving the right message, you know? And uh, so, anyway, uh, we go into the office, and we sit down with the mayor, and... Uh, 
I, I said, we introduced ourselves, and I says, well, I'm a prophet, and this is what God says for you. And I prophesied over him, and see, first I understand that I need to give a word that will open their understanding and let them know I'm really from God. So I'll give a deeply personal word because I'm prophesying to the wilderness in their soul. I'm prophesying to that place they, need, they want to hear from God and the authenticity. So I looked at him and I said, the Lord shows me that you are called to heal the ecosystem, the ecology of the city of Seoul. And you're going to start bus lanes, and it's going to cut down the pollution. And it was very detailed. What I didn't know, that he had been, I think, the president or vice president of a major corporation, and that was their specialty, cutting down pollution. He had already uncovered a river that had been covered over in World War II by the Blue Palace. It's like their White House and made a green space and already creating bus lanes. So I knew, I'm watching him, and I knew that opened the door, so I went in for it and I said, and the Lord says you are to run for president. You are going to be the next president of Korea. Isn't that fun? <laughs> now, I will tell you, did he win? And, and what I didn't know was his wife didn't know who I was, had it been praying that I would give him a word if he should run for president. So his election, the, the election cycle was very tumultuous. And his wife told me, I went and got my hair done. I got my dress for the inauguration because is there not a word? Are you listening to me? Is there not a word? And he was elected presently, was elected president of Korea. Amen. And then I prophesied to him, now you're going to host the economic summits of the world. And the, the, I think it was G8 then. It's G7 now. They hosted first time. And I prophesied all during the whole administration. And that, he's not the only president I've done that with. You see, but what is the Lord saying? Come up higher. Come up higher. And I have a dream for you that God will use you. I was, I was talking to this 13-year-old. Come up here, 13-year-old. I can't remember. You told me your name. Come here. He's so cute. All the way up here. Come here. Isn't he just adorable? I'm probably embarrassing him to death. Tell me your name again. I know you told me. Justin? No. Jaden. Jaden. I knew it was a J word. Now, this young man, God has such a call on his life. And I don't know anything about you, Jaden, but God specially loves you. And you've gone through some hard times in your life. But the Lord has rescued you. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Because you have a big calling. And you're going to preach the gospel, Jaden. And one day you're going to be a pastor. And you're going to lead a great church. And you're going to be a good shepherd to God's people. Amen. Amen. You know, there's three uses of prophecy. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. And as we met together this year, one thing that came out is that we have exercised the edification gift and the exhortation gift, but have we manifested the comforting gift of the Holy Spirit? And one of the words God gave us, dipping a little bit into my notes finally in the last short moment, God spoke to us that in the last year, he had us focus on Psalm 23. Why? We were coming out of the pandemic, and we needed to manifest comfort as prophets. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. What does it say? Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, how many people died? I mean, we had so much loss. So we have to understand the ways of the Holy Spirit. We have to manifest a fullness of the gift. We have to learn the language of heaven and the way God would speak to each and every individual person from a three-year-old to a 90-year-old. You see, when I'm up here, I am responsible for your souls before God. And I feel that responsibility, even up over there. And... And have I communicated as a prophet in a way that I'm speaking to all of you? Because usually, sometimes we, pre we preach at people, but not with people. You understand that? There's a relationship, a community of the saints. And what does that make us feel? We feel like family, don't we? We feel like we're together. We feel like we're not alone. So what is manifesting is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Try it again. Amen? Amen? I know you're awake. Okay. And so we needed that. Now, this year, multiple prophets said we're going from Psalm 23 to Psalm 24. The Lord, strong and mighty in battle. Who is this king of glory? Because we're in a war season. And the Lord also gave us a word a year ago that said he was going to be coming to clean house, essentially. That judgment was going to begin at the house of God first. Listen, we need to have the fear of the Lord on our lives. To whom much is given, much is required. Some people say, oh, I'd love to be a visible leader. And I think, would you? I made the mistake of reading the criticisms on the web of me. I got through about four pages of them. And it's like the Holy Spirit said, what are you doing? I'm like, um. You're watching me. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Is that edifying you? No. And the Lord said, well, just don't do that anymore. I'm well able to correct you. And you have enough people around you that you're accountable to that they're going to keep your life straight. But that is not going to do any good for you. So I want to tell you something. Yes, if the CNN goes after you, as I've experienced, or MSNBC or New York Times or whatever, you know what you should say? That is a badge of honor. But don't be reading all that mess, putting it into your spirit. Now listen, that's a hot tip, I'm telling you. You might have just come to Morningstar to hear that one thing. Because we have to come up higher. Amen. And we have to understand that we're in a war season. When you're in a war season, you have to have the fear of the Lord on your life. He might tell you to go into that place, or he might tell you not to go into that place. You know, we, we, we're sending out shields up alerts, you know, that they say that we're probably for terrorist alerts, more than we've had in 50 years or maybe in our history. Every day in America, it could be a ticking time bomb. And, you know, we've got to learn how to use our gifts. I was sharing with uh, Chris Reed, you know, we were talking before the service yesterday, that, that when God gives you influence and, when, when, and God gives you favor, those are treasures, and when God tells you to use your favor, you use it. When he tells you don't use it, don't use it. When you could call about any Christian leader, get through to them, and many presidents or things, you have leverage. You have something you could do. You have influence. Well, when I began to hear about all the terrorist threats, I, I am, first of all, a prophetic intercessor, okay? I'm a prophet, but I'm an intercessor. And we, we have to understand 
that when God tells something, he's revealing it because he wants to avert it. Rarely, rarely. I mean, in the case of when we met the first time with the prophets about Y2K and God gave us a word that something worse was coming than any two Y2K. And it was going to be horrific. And people started sharing dreams they had about, about cruise ships uh, crashing into the East Coast and people jumping off the, the ship screaming. You know, I mean, we started one after the other had had warning dreams. I said, to, for our group, I said, can this be totally averted? And one of the prophets said, no, but it can be lessened. And we fell on our face. I don't know when I have cried that hard. Not even at the death of my father. Not even the death of my loved ones. Somebody was crying their guts out next to me, and I looked over there, and that's how I really met James Gall, because he was just crying his eyes out. And we know that God did lessen it. But, but usually that's the exception. God warns to avert. And so, I mean, if he was just going to do it, why would he tell anybody, right? You know, he's just going to do it. Remember Nineveh. So anyway, but we, I, I, I saw, I was watching, I had just flown home from Israel, given the 911 word, and the, I just, I knew, I said, Lord, on our university campuses, there are going to be terrorist attacks everywhere. This is before, really, maybe there was one pro-Palestinian march. I mean, none of that was very visible yet. And I said, okay, God, you have given me influence. How do I avert? And one of the first things I did was call Chris Reed and Jeremiah Johnson and Jane Hammond and Mike and I, and we talked about the dreams and things that were happening. Many, many people have had dreams about terrorist attacks. But I, the Lord said, I want you to mobilize prayer on university campuses. And so, you know, Jason Ma here has done that. Bob Weiner, of course, has done it. And so I called my friend Jonathan Nye, Sharon Nye. They have essentially the Hollywood House of Prayer. They right by Hollywood Boulevard. They have a 24-7 house of prayer. And so I said, you know a lot of the prayer leaders from the campuses. And they said, yes. So we got on a Zoom call like the next day. And I said, we've got to next, on 11-11, we have to mobilize prayer on as many university campuses as we can. We've got to prayer walk these campuses. And so what happened was, you know, I, I think maybe about 200 of the campuses have some kind of prayer. But from the mobilization, Sharon and I got the word, we should call it Operation Psalm 91, and we think maybe a thousand university campuses were prayer walked within a week. I mean, clap your hands. And we know we must keep praying. Pray Psalm 91 over your family every morning. If you don't, please. You know, the rabbi said it was to be prayed in case of demonic attack. I remember when we were in Columbia, I was preaching in Bogota when there was a lot of bombings going on, and we would have to have a little mini prayer meeting where we should go eat lunch because that restaurant was bombed last week, and we didn't know if this restaurant was going to be bombed this week. Isn't that a fun life? I'm telling you, it's so exciting. And so, you know, I mean, here I am today. The restaurant we went to did get bombed later, but it didn't get bombed the day we were there, okay? You know, so I want to say to you, and there's many, many things I didn't talk about today, but I'm going to wrap it. God wants you to come up higher. I was thinking when I was sitting over there, I, I don't want to make you nervous, but I kind of radar you. <laughs> kind of radar the crowd, you know, and, uh, and the balconies, upper and lower deck. And um, uh, I, I was just saying to the Lord, who's in this room? And the Lord reminded me when we were doing in 1991, we were doing outdoor meetings 
large outdoor meetings in a field in Resistencia, Argentina, in the north of Argentina. And um, we had a little driver, and he had borrowed a car because all him and his wife owned was a pink motor scooter. And so he borrowed a car, and he was driving us around the city, 25 years old. And I remember we prayed for that young man, and he was such a servant. And, Jaden, this reminds me what I'm talking about with you, son. And uh, today, Jorge Ledesma, that young man, has built a building that sees 18,000 people in that city and built it for cash and has a whole network of churches. I want to say to you, there is greatness in this room and those listening online because the great God is inside of you. Don't limit what he can do with you. He is a limitless God. He is a great and mighty God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of the host of heaven. And you were created in his image. God created you because you have a purpose in this earth, because God has a need for something to be be done. So don't be a settler. Be a pioneer. Let God use you to do great and mighty things. Can we give a shout unto the Lord? Hallelujah! Stand to your feet. Hallelujah! So I commission you. I commission you in the war time. It's time to raise up and be wartime intercessors. Elect a wartime president. Let God use us together to mobilize, to be a family, but to be an army. Let the bridegroom come out of the bridal chamber. And Father, I pray for all of those here and all of those listening. We we send you, Ekbalo, we send you into the harvest and to do great things for God. Lord, use us to help save America. Use us to help save the United States and use us to bring revival to the nation and the world. Come on, give a shout. Amen.